Do you love coffee and Monero as much as we do? Consider making gratuitous.org your daily cup. Pay with Monero for premium fresh beans, and if you like what you taste, send a digital cash tip directly to the Guatemalan farmers that made it possible. Proceeds help us grow this channel, Gratuitous, and Monero. This week on Monero Talk is sponsored by Cake Wallet. Store, send, receive, and exchange your Monero and Bitcoin safely on iOS and Android too. Cake Wallet is open source, and you always control your own keys. And by Sweetwater Digital Asset Consulting, connecting new money with old money since 2018. Cake Wallet and Sweetwater Digital are trusted and verified by the Monero community. Monero Talk is also made possible from contributions by viewers and listeners like you. This week on Monero Talk. Douglas Tuman interviews Luke Smith, a well-known privacy and FOSS advocate. Doug and Luke discuss the importance of privacy, the flaws of Bitcoin that maximalists overlook, the benefits of Monero and what direction it is headed, and if he sees crypto being the solution to the mass surveillance through technology. Monero Talk starts now. Thanks for doing this, man. Yeah, no problem. Good to be here. Thanks for having me on. So I think you're... Uh... You're a, kind of a well-known personality, I think, uh, among the Monero community and among... I don't, I don't know what what exactly is your genre on the internet. I was trying man, to figure it out. Man, I don't know. I, I've <laughs> never tried for the genre thing. I just do... <laughs> hey, I'm just a normal guy. I started a YouTube channel. I just do videos on random stuff. Originally, it was just on Linux and tutorials and stuff like that. But it, it just branches out as people want more, I feel like it. Like, honestly, it, well, recently I got into Monero um, just because I guess I sort of got into cryptocurrency. And I think inevitably you're going to be nudged toward Monero because it sort of has that, I don't know, it, it sort of has the distilled, like it does everything right. You know what I mean? And everything else is just sort of details. Um, so, you know, that's what you could say about that. But um, um yeah, as for genre, I just do whatever, you know, it doesn't make sense. Like, if you look at my YouTube channel or anything else, I, I do a lot of videos on a lot of things. I write about a lot of things on my website. It, it doesn't matter to me. But um, but yeah, we, we can talk about whatever Monero or crypto related, I guess. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, definitely want to get to Monero. But yeah, I want to understand you a little bit better. So I've been, you know, I discovered you through Monero. Oh, so, is that so? Uh, yeah. That's interesting. See, I, I know I've done a couple, I did maybe one video on it and a couple blog posts, but I don't know, maybe they had imp more impact than I expected in Monero people. Um, uh, one of them was just talking about, I, I think it was something like, you know, Mon the argument for Monero maximalism and, and stuff like that. Um, because as time has gone on, I really feel like, well, the idea behind maximalism, you know, let's take Bitcoin maximalism, is really just most of the stuff that you see in the cryptocurrency sphere I mean, to put it pol politely, I mean, not that it's scammy, but there's so much confusion and really the core of using cryptocurrency to store and exchange value, that is the most important thing. Um, and the way that people are doing this or that token and doing this or that project, it, it, it's details, you know. Um, I, I've said before, and this isn't talking bad about any particular project. And in, in fact, I'll use one that I guess... I have a stake in, right? So if you're on the internet and you have an internet presence, you can get, you know, basic attention token, just as an example. Anyone who has a YouTube channel can get BAT. Um, but the difference between a lot of these cryptocurrency projects like BAT is that they're really, they're really tech companies that use a blockchain or a cryptocurrency to fund their tech enterprise, okay? And there are things about the basic attention token project that I like. I, I think they do cut out a lot of the middlemen chip in ads and stuff like that. But when it comes down to it, it is not, it's not like Bitcoin, okay? It's not really decentralized. It's not, you know, the nice thing about Bitcoin or Monero is that they're self-propelling in the sense that um, you set up the system and the system itself has its own momentum. You have miners and they do this and that. Um, but a lot of cryptocurrency projects out there, and again, this is not me talking about BAT or uh, I, I guess another thing that, you know, a lot of people on the internet are in is uh, the library protocol. This is not dissing about any of those people, but um, they're they're not 
really the, the ideal of cryptocurrency, the, the decentralized nature. They're really just taking that decentralized core and using it in a more, you know, they're kind of top down engineering how they want this system to work. That's why you have ICOs. That's why you have dev taxes and all this kind of silliness. Um, but an ideal system is one like Bitcoin or Monero, uh, where you have this a self-propelling system. And that's the thing that I think everyone needs to be shooting for. So, uh, yeah, I mean, do you so what other projects do you put into that category that really uh, has that self-propelling nature? To there, it? there aren't many. Honestly, Bitcoin and Monero, I mean, even things like Ethereum, you know, Ethereum has a, a, a good bit of centralization to it. So that's why I say, you, you know, the idea of maximalism is this idea that, listen, they're going to be a bunch of I don't want to call them scams, but there's going to people are shooting in the dark. We are in the Wild West. There are a bunch of projects out there. Some of them are going to take off. Some of them are going to make a big difference. I think Ethereum is a good example of something that already is. But the ideal is something closer to what Monero and Bitcoin is. And honestly, I can't really name any other projects off the top of my head. There probably are some, but there are so few of them that actually have that decentralized core. And I, I think that's, you know, that should be more important. When people are sitting down and, you know, devising cryptocurrency projects, they really need to be thinking about, OK, if all of us running the project die, will it continue? OK, with Bitcoin and Monero, arguably, that's very much the case. It's not the case when you have a cryptocurrency that has a company and a CEO. You know what I mean? Um, and this isn't just like anti having a business. No, that's not at all. We're talking about making a protocol for the Internet that's going to survive any individual party, you know? So. Yeah. Couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I think that's what really the breakthrough was, right? Was figuring that out, how to create a decentralized, self-propelling network um, that bootstraps itself. Um, I think a lot of people just don't really understand what decentralization means. You know, yeah. I remember, I remember when I went from not understanding it to understanding. You know, for me, it was it was an unfamiliar thing. I remember when. People first started, I mean, obviously they're talking about it before that, but like when I first heard about it was uh, when they were kind of, I forget the name of the group, uh, Diaspora was trying to reinvent like a decentralized version of Facebook. Do you yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, they, they have projects out there. Yeah. But that, that was like pre Bitcoin. That was before all. And that was like my first encounter with this concept of, you know, a decentralized, a more decentralized network. Like, so I think a lot of people, uh, I think it's quite abstract, you know, I think people don't really, obviously you understand it, I get it, uh, but I think a lot of people that are just kind of getting introduced to crypto don't really truly understand what it means to be decentralized and the right. importance of that and then how that, you know, how it's, I, I don't think they're really um, understanding that component of it and that's why they're kind of overlooking the true value proposition of what this stuff is. Right. I think some of them obviously do understand and they're just scamming, but I think there actually yeah. is a disconnect there with yeah. understanding that that's the value, this ability to have this system that's running on its own with yeah. no central authority uh, and is allowing people to communicate in a censorship yeah. resistant way. I just don't think people really appreciate those terms and understand yeah. those concepts. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, I'm not I'm not dismissing other projects. I think it is a, a valid thing to use a blockchain and a token to maybe fund your company. But it is I mean, it's not the ideal. You know what I mean? It's It can't be a, a protocol for the whole Internet. Um, it might be nice. I mean, it is nice that we have projects out there that you can buy a token. And that's more or less like buying a little stock. You know, it's 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 kind of you know, it's like penny stocks. Anyone can buy into this system. But that's not, you know, for an internet protocol, that's not ideal. Um, and, and then, of course, Bitcoin itself, I think, uh, it, in the difference between Bitcoin and Monero, that brings up some other, you know, uh, I, I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. I'm not against Bitcoin, but I do think that, you know, Bitcoin has some flaws that I, I think a lot of the maximalists overlook long term. Um, I mean, specifically, I think there's always this cope of, well, Bitcoin has issues. You know, let's say... You know, maybe mining is too decent or too centralized. Maybe there are tr all these extreme transaction fees. You know, if I want to send you five dollars on the Bitcoin network right now, if I try and send it, I'll have to pay 10 or 15 dollars in fees. It's obscene. Right. So n there's no such thing as using Bitcoin for an actual, you know, medium of exchange. It really is just and 
that's why you have maximalists out there. What do they say that Bitcoin does? Well, they just say it's a store of value, right? You put money in it and forget about it. And I, I think, you know, one thing that I think people need to think about who, who make that kind of argument is the fact that you can add layer two onto Bitcoin. You can have the Lightning Network. You can have, um, you know, to, to take an extreme example, you know, my, someone like Michael Saylor will even say things like Coinbase or Kraken. These are layer two on top of Bitcoin. And that's a good thing. And the, the issue with that is, you know, if you look at human history, OK, let's look at gold. OK, Bitcoin is digital gold, right? Well, Bitcoin will probably follow the exact same thing that happened to gold in that gold was originally used as a store of value, but it's a terrible currency for the similar reasons, actually, that Bitcoin is. It's hard to transact with. Uh, gold is also hard to divide. It's hard to transport. Um, so, you know, what people did is they invented a layer two for gold and that's called paper currency. You know, you went into the market in Venice and instead of trading gold, you turned in your gold at the bank. They gave you paper notes and you use those paper notes that are what so much better. Well, we can see what happened with this deficient store of value gold. I mean, well, it's a great store of value, but it's bad currency gold uh, in that it's layer two eventually took over. People started saying, well, oh, well, let's say in the, the American Civil War, the government said, oh, well, you know, we're we don't read the gold standard is very constraining. We're going to temporarily not redeem your gold. We're going to throw some more money in there to stimulate the economy. Oh, it's no problem. We'll go back on the gold standard later. And they did. But what eventually happens is the layer two phenomena overtakes the, the core of it. And that to me is the problem with Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is not a usable, it's not fungible, uh, it's not private, it doesn't have, you know, transaction fees are totally unworkable. So what you end up happening, what ends up happening is that the layer two takes over what Bitcoin is supposed to do. Um, and that's the issue. We'll be back at square one, you know, if Bitcoin actually takes over. Um, which I don't think it will anyway, because it's so unusable. Like you'll never have businesses out there actually just requiring Bitcoin. You know, I don't think that'll ever happen. Um, Do you think, you know, so totally agree with you. So the fact that Bitcoin is really a store of value and nothing else. Yeah. Um, do you think, I, I mean, I, I start, I'm starting to argue that that makes it, you know, not, not even work fundamentally as a store of value because it's kind of just yeah. a greater fool thing at this point and it doesn't have any underlying value at all right at that point if it's not it's no longer uh, a system for transacting so like i see kind of you know monero's base utility is the right. fact that it can be used to send transactions in a private way censorship resistant way so you know if tomorrow everybody decided that you know, Monero is really not worth anything. It's worth a few dollars. And, you know, right. um, well, there's people are still going to use it, though, because they're sure. going to need to they're going to use it for that purpose. If tomorrow everybody said, you know, Bitcoin, we've decided Bitcoin uh, is worth zero now. There is yeah. it. There, there is really no then use. Well, like, all right, it's it's only worth a few dollars, but I, I still need to use Bitcoin. There's really no need for it oh, at yeah. that point. Yeah. Whereas Monero has his base use and. I just feel like the fact that Bitcoin has solely become a store of value, uh, it really has no leg to stand on anymore. Do you see yeah. it that way? Or am I, you think I'm over? Uh... Um, I, th I think there's a part of that that's right, but I, I want to, I'm not going to defend Bitcoin, uh, but I'll, I'll put it this way. Bitcoin is a system, and this is a total accident, okay? Bitcoin is supposed to be what Monero is. I want to be clear. It's supposed to be exactly what Monero is, but it isn't, Okay. Um, however, due to the way that the Bitcoin network is constructed, I mean, let me put it this way. Bitcoin, it has a huge price right now, you know, you know, $35,000, whatever it is, maybe it'll be more or less, who knows. Uh, but it has a massive price. And I think actually one of the reasons it's so high is because it's bad as a currency. OK, a lot of people are using it. But think about it this way. I mean, think about the game theoretics of using Bitcoin. It's expensive to transact with. And that basically incentivizes people to hodl it. You know, you're not going it, to it's hard to day trade with Bitcoin if every time you're trading, you're paying these massive transaction fees. Right. It's also impossible to have, you know, as I said, it's hard to have a business where you're going to receive Bitcoin. Now, it'd be easy to do that with Monero. Right. Uh, but the people who receive Bitcoin for transactions, they're doing it just to, oh, I accept Bitcoin. You know what I mean? 
Uh, but because transaction fees are actually so high in Bitcoin, that is it's kind of like a game theoretic incentive that keep people from spending it, which actually decreases the velocity of exchange, which actually increases the price if you think it through. So I think there's a sense in which um, Bitcoin, arguably its function as a store of value is only the case because it's a bad currency. And I think the closest thing you can have to a, uh, you know, a, a experimental circumstance is the difference between Bitcoin and Bitcoin cash, which no one cares about. I mean, except for Bitcoin cash people, but where Bitcoin, what's the difference between them? Well, Bitcoin cash solved the transaction fee problem. You know, they increase the block size and stuff like this. And it suddenly becomes a bad store of value because people jumping into it, they can easily exchange it much easier. Uh, you can have a business that take, and there are some that actually uh, require Bitcoin cash. Um, so my view of Bitcoin is, I, I, I do think that Monero is a serious currency, um, you know, much more serious than Bitcoin. But I think just this historical accident, I think that Bitcoin is going to continue to be used as a store of value. Now, as time goes on, the utility of Monero, I think, will win out. But, um, you know, I'm not telling anyone, anyone to dump their Bitcoin bags now. That, that's, it's probably going to keep going up, you know, in 10 years. Um, but I, I think that's, it's similar to gold in that it is a deficient currency. Therefore, the incentives are to hold on to it. And lots of people are already in this. It has networking effects behind it, too. Um, so for better or for worse, I think Bitcoin's going to be here for a while. Um, yeah, I mean... But I mean, any Bitcoiner will tell you, listen, Bitcoin can overcome and will overcome gold yeah. as a store of value. Right. And I think that's very possible, too. So. Right. So do I. But if you think that's possible, then isn't it possible for Monero to then overcome Bitcoin and become the store of value? I, and, you know, and I totally agree with you with, you know, Bitcoin having these attributes that essentially have turned it into nothing more than a store of value really isn't useful for anything beyond that. Uh, but at that point, why not just use like gold is almost does does that better than Bitcoin? If we're just storing value, right? why not just use gold at that point? I don't I don't need to get it over to you. I, you know, I, 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 it's OK if it costs a lot of money to move it around. You know, it's yeah. um, so that's why I've become disillusioned even with this this right. idea that. All right. So, well, Bitcoin is just going to be the store of value coin and right. then it'll be other Moneros, maybe, maybe the transactional one. But yeah. I just I'm finding it hard to see how you could have something that literally is only used as a store of value. Right. Well, uh, that's in, in Bitcoin's defense, I mean, I, I, there's a point at which I, I'm going to agree with you in that I think as time goes on, the utility of Monero is going to supersede any historical store of value of Bitcoin. Um, but, you know, the reason you don't use Monero and then gold as a store of value is there's not going to be a Monero v. gold atomic swap. You know, Bitcoin can sort of function. I mean, the way I've talked, I've told it to people that I know is um, I think in the midterm, I, I think of Monero as being like a checking account and Bitcoin as being sort of like a long term savings account. And again, that's not because Bitcoin is particularly good. It's actually because Bitcoin is bad. It's because it has this dense, this incentive of using it. Uh, and so people have this, you know, they're going to hodl it. Uh, and that's just how it is. But I do think that as time goes on, you know, the best currency will probably win. And uh, it, which could be anything. But right now, I think Monero is so far ahead of any other project in terms of, um, you know, it's it's actually really decentralized. It's ASIC resistant, you know, low transaction fees. They're doing everything right. A lot of people say Monero is like a privacy coin. And it is. But they they do everything right. That that's the real reason I think it's it's worth looking at. Um, and when now, you, if you go on the internet, I mean, we all know that the dark web uses Monero. No one's going to use a shielded Zcash transaction. No one's going to use Dash. No one's using Bitcoin with you know CoinJoin. All of that stuff is trash. Monero works. It works now. It works in a funny way. You know, uh, I, I've been an advocate. I think long term Monero should definitely look at using a form of zero knowledge proofs instead of the uh, ring signature, you know, all this kind of stuff, which is sort of hacky. Mm -hmm. um, but as it is right now, there's no competition. OK, the, the ones that are using zero knowledge proofs uh, out here, the currencies out there, uh, they're either trusted or it's something like Zcash, where it's basically a centrally organized structure with a bunch of dev taxes and all this other stuff. So Monero is just number one when it comes down to it. Um, 
And that's why it's taken over the dark web. And, you know, it, people actually using cryptocurrency use Monero, you know? 100%. 100%. Couldn't agree with you more. It's, it's, it's refreshing to have somebody on where I'm not, uh, you know, <laughs> arguing against these points, but having actually, you know, somebody's actually agreeing with me because I'm normally talking to Bitcoin maxis and it's. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, I understand the arguments, and it's it's tiring. It's tiring, and I feel bad for my audience. Yeah. But I, I do it because I, I, you know, I want those people to be exposed, and the people that are following them will yeah. hopefully come across this video where you know they're they're questioned, and right. you know, I, th- I think I think it does help get the information out there. Right. Well, in their defense, you know, you have to put it. You have to think of it in their shoes. If you've been on Bitcoin for ten years. You have seen everything come and go and you think everything's a freaking scam because most of it is and most of it is is just, you know, passing in the wind. And so if some other currency comes out and does it right, I mean, it, it's sort of like the boy who cried wolf. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, it's probably garbage anyway. Right. I trust in the lightning network. It's going to it's all going to work out eventually. But, you know, as I said before, the, the problem with Bitcoin maximalism and the problem with the whole layer two thing is that you you're not really using the decentralized core of Bitcoin. You're building cruft on top of it. And it's most important to have, um, you know, I, I actually listened to part of the the interview you had, uh, I forget the guy's name, right before me. Just, I watched it. I, I think he was a Bitcoin maxi. Um, but, you know, his, the case- oh, Mark he, Moss. Mark yeah. Moss? Okay. Yeah. So I watched part of that. And the case that he made, and I understand this is, oh, well, we have to have a dumb uh, base layer. And then you build the good stuff on top of it. And, and I think that, I mean, I understand that totally. You want a simple base layer, but you want that base layer to do everything that you really need. I mean, just as an example, let's say take something like email, okay? Um, the thing with email is that everyone uses it. Everyone has a, you know, it's part of the internet for good. Uh, everyone has an email account, but the, you know, SMTP protocol is actually terrible because none of it is by default encrypted. Now there's no reason to ever send an email to someone without it being encrypted. You know what I mean? No one wants to send an email to someone that anyone else can read. So that should be a core functionality of email. But we, you know, and of course you can encrypt an email with like GPG, but that's hard to use. And the metadata isn't, you know, encrypted. There are all these problems because we didn't build that into the base layer. And my contention is, you know, when it comes to a currency, the fungibility of the currency is priority number one and the privacy of people using it. I think a lot of people will say stuff like, um, oh, you know, I don't care if people see my transactions. I'm not doing anything illegal, which is it's it's an easy thing to say because no one has ever lived in the world where anyone can see your transactions. That is a totally novel thing. Right. So we we, we can't even I mean, I think even um, um, a fluffy pony. Right. He, he's done presentations. Those who don't know, that's one of the lead Monero guys. But he's done presentations. Uh, quoting statistics saying that something like 10% of people, you know, they're, they're the only ones who actually care about financial transaction privacy. Okay. But the only reason that so few number of people care about that is because they've never had to deal with it. Like if, if any uh, stalker or, you know, potential burglar could easily read your transaction history and your wallet amount, you would understand very quickly that you know, Monero. It's not. It's not a dark net currency for weirdos. It's a currency that everyone needs. It's it. The privacy function fundamentally protects people who uh, just nor- who are just normal people and want to get a- get around. And currencies just don't work I- unless they are totally private. Even it, and I, I think people also confuse. Um, you know, it's one thing to have like Visa and Mastercard having your data. Okay, that's a privacy liability. But it's a, it's a whole other thing if Visa and MasterCard put all of your transactions on the internet for anyone to see, because that's what Bitcoin does. That's exactly what a blockchain is. So I I don't think people really think through the ramifications of it because frankly, right now, Bitcoin isn't really used for anything, you know? So. Yeah. 100% people aren't realizing the, the importance Um, and they're not realizing uh, the direction we're headed in or have already arrived at with technology. And, you know, the point of the degree to which we can be surveilled um, yeah. and that it's reaching a, a, a point of, of no return if it hasn't already. Right. And I think if I, if we would have had this conversation a few years ago or before Bitcoin, we would have been talking in a much more fatalistic way. But do you yeah. see, do you see crypto as a solution to this, uh, you know, 
that you know a solution to this problem that we're upon with this you know mass surveillance through uh, technology? Oh yeah, I mean, well, Monero, not Bitcoin. I definitely see Monero as a solution to that. Um, and I think that once people dip their toes into it, they will come to realize why it all makes sense. I mean, you know, I was I was thinking a, a little bit ago. I'm I'm thinking about buying a used car, okay? Um, and you know, that's to let's say I want to buy a used car that costs you know a couple thousand bucks. Well, getting that couple thousand dollars in cash, that's actually a hard thing to do. OK, but if we had if we had a digital, you know, transaction, if, if it were the norm to use something like cryptocurrency, it's very easy to transact a couple thousand dollars. Whereas in you know the current financial system, you got to get, you know, cashier's checks or you got to cash get cash from your bank. But you might have to do it multiple days because there's a limit on how many you can withdraw, you know, all these kind of frustration. I mean, the nice thing about cryptocurrency is it really puts you even Bitcoin, it puts um, you know, your finances at in your control and it really lets you use them, you know, in, in whatever ways are appropriate without, I mean, you can build stuff on top of that if you want, but it, it does what it's supposed to do. And that, I don't know, yeah. but it's very liberating having that. And I think people take it for granted. Yeah. I mean, I, I said Bitcoin cause you know, I do think Bitcoin was invented for that purpose, okay. but yeah, I think it's, it's failing at that. And ultimately it's something like Monero that's going to fulfill that need. So yeah. do you think, do you think something like Monero or Monero itself is inevitable in terms of the fact that it has these attributes that it's, it's become this technology or is it uh, a matter of society adopting it? So, right, because we're, we're, there is a struggle right now. I mean, I'm I do, part of the reason why I do this show is because I want to make sure Monero does succeed. I want to make right. sh help the technology. Uh, but how do you see it? Do you see it as um, not necessarily something that's inevitable? Like we could go another direction or? I mean, I, I think there are many things you can say are inevitable. It just is an issue of how much pain are we going to have to go through before we get to that state. Um, so that's why I think it's very important to be aware of these issues now. Um, now, out already, and you know, I don't want to use them as a positive example, but if you look at people who are on the dark web um, do, transacting in Monero, they're doing it because they know that they can be burned with using any kind of other currency. And I think when, nor I mean, the reason that they use it and we don't is not because it's a difference between legalness and illegalness. Um, it's really a difference because, just because they're the only ones using cryptocurrency for a lot of their transactions. And I think once we got to, if we get to a state where cryptocurrency is a normal thing that people use at a daily basis, they're gonna very quickly realize uh, you know, why it's important to have a private and fungible currency. Because I mean, you put yourself in the shoes, let's say, Let's say Bitcoin works as a currency and you start a business, a coffee shop, and uh, you accept Bitcoin. OK, well, let's say a guy comes in every single morning and buys a coffee and, you know, sends money to your address. And then a year later, you know, some journalist finds out that, I don't know, he uh, there's something weird. You know, he said the N word or something uh, playing Call of Duty. You never know. It could be something so minor, something irrelevant. But the, the issue with a the blockchain is that it, it is a rumor mill. It, it's a rumor mill in the sense that people can look into it and see transactions, they see what you're getting, and then they make up, you know, they, they let their mind run wild with it. And I think once people realize that that is how Bitcoin works, that is how these other currencies work, um, the, it, it's totally unworkable. You know, even these people who are calling, mind you, for censorship of people, I think even they will realize it's not gonna work because even, I mean, the, the currency system we have now is private, okay? There are a lot of vulnerabil vulnerabilities in it, like Visa and MasterCard might have your information, but you know, you don't have my information, right? right. And that, that should be at least the metric. We shouldn't be choosing Bitcoin, which does something worse than that, right. you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. People have an expectation of privacy and they think Bitcoin is meeting it, but they have no idea that it's, you know, uh, yeah. the opposite of what they're signing up to. Right, it, it's just ignorance. Most people expect, again, they hear the word crypto and they're like, oh, it's like hidden or something. You know, they, they don't understand it's about cryptography, not about, you know, it being cryptic. Um, and I think um, in, in their defense, in the defense of maximalists, um, you know, people 10 years ago or, you know, let's say five years ago, I don't think anyone expected Bitcoin to be so monitored. I, I think um, they would probably 
say, oh, yeah, you know, you can look at transactions, but it's not a big deal because your name isn't on them. I, I don't think anyone anticipated that you would have these massive organizations uh, and probably governments that try their hardest to uh, match addresses with names and transactions. I don't think anyone ever thought that we would be in, you know, in that state. But now we are. So that's why we have to have a foolproof, you know, private transaction scheme. Yeah. When I, when I first got into Bitcoin, like late 2013, early 2014, when I first started looking at it. And I do remember there, you know, it was being discussed in the forums um, then was like, I don't know how, how much earlier than that. Well, obviously, uh, you know, it was brought up in the very early days, the issues with privacy, but really discussed in terms of, uh, you know, chain analytics and what, you know, that these companies are actually going to exist, guys, and they're going to start analyzing the chain. But yeah, I mean, it has it has blown up in such a, such a major way now. Um, I think it's becoming to the point where people can no longer ignore it. Yeah. Um, I, I think also we should be thankful that Monero, the benefit of it is not just the privacy, but as I said, they do everything else right. So ASIC resistance, meaning, hey, a random guy can you, if he has a beefy gaming computer or not even a gaming computer, but a beefy computer, he, hey, he can start mining it. You can't do that with Bitcoin or transaction fees. Hey, you can actually buy some Monero and send it to your friends, you know, if you owe him some money or something like that. Doing that with Bitcoin is, is impossible. So Monero right now is accessible and usable. And I, I think that if people bought into it and have your friends buy just a little bit, um, it's nice just to have an account if you need to transfer value to someone else, if you owe them something. Uh, it is much better than using anything else. And Bitcoin is not like that. So we should be thankful that Monero has all the other benefits as well, in addition yeah. to privacy. No, it actually works as digital cash. It's not like, yeah. hey, we're waiting for the second layer or the, right. you know, may one day do this. It's I don't think people have have realized that to a large degree. Um, when did you uh, when did you get into crypto? Has it was it, was it many years ago? I mean, you don't have to give exact dates. Embarrassingly so. recent. So okay. I am very much, I, I'm really an old boomer when it comes to technology. I use, I mean, I, I, I mean, I have known about Bitcoin. This is embarrassing. I've known about it since it very, you know, since its first beginnings, you know, and of course, like a moron, I was like, oh, in a couple of years, no one's going to be talking about this. Um, and of course, I said that every single year. Now, when you say you knew about then, did you did you understand that? Oh, like, I, I didn't understand it. Basic but I knew, value prop that it was trying to be a decentralized. Yeah, there's, there's network. some kind of fake internet money and line goes up, uh, okay, and that's all okay, I knew okay, about okay. it. Okay, so it, it wasn't actually until I started my YouTube channel, and every once in a while, I'd get uh, emails from people, "Dude, you should get a Bitcoin donation address," and I'm just like. I don't know anything. And I regret not doing that because I could have gotten some good money back in 2015 or whenever yeah, I started yeah, yeah. my youth because, you know, Bitcoins were pretty cheap back then. Um, but Monero, and of course, when I started a Bitcoin wallet, it just meant me going to whatever exchange. And, you know, I, I didn't know the difference between a, you know, a private, a real wallet and a fake Coinbase wallet, you know, which is really just you giving them money and pretending that you own this money that you don't have. Um and it wasn't in really until people nagged me about uh, uh, Monero that I actually really looked into it. And that was because the exchange I was using didn't have Monero. So I was like, oh, I guess I have to, you know, a lot of people want me to get this. Maybe I should just look into it. And this is probably like last year. This is very recent. OK, I want to be clear. I am not I'm not, uh, you know, an originalist whale sitting on fat stacks, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but, you know, so eventually people nagged me into doing it. And I'm very thankful they did because, um, you know, it's a much better, it's just better. And, uh, you know, I remember I, I used the command line wallet and I remember downloading the blockchain on my internet, which is incredibly slow. But uh, man, that, that's great. It's, it's nice having it. It's nice. It's nice having a wallet, a digital wallet the way it's supposed to be. You know what I mean? So uh, long story short, I'm a very, I'm very much a latecomer, but um, since now that I sort of get it, now that I've looked into it and Monero actually encouraged me to look into all these other currencies as well. But, you know, Monero is the one that matters. <laughs> you started so. in the right place. So what, did you even like, were you considering Bitcoin as well then? Or, I mean, it sounds like you really entered in through Monero or have I mean, you, did yeah, you transition well, I mean, not, from I, being a, a believer in Bitcoin into Monero or re you really learned about crypto as you learned about Monero? You know, it all sort of happened at once. And I think I got a Monero. I mean, um, I was gradually figuring things out with Bitcoin, but mostly it was just like, I, I'm doing all this other stuff. I want to think about it later. You know what I mean? 
Um, so I wouldn't say I started with Monero, but um, I, I guess when you learn about Monero, this is the weird thing. You know, as, as we said, a lot of people have misunderstandings about Bitcoin. They just assume that it's private or something. They assume all these things about it. But you actually learn a lot more about Bitcoin when you look into something like Monero and you realize, oh, Monero you know, has ring signatures and stealth addresses. What does that actually mean? Bitcoin doesn't have this you know, by definition. Um, and the other thing is uh, because a lot of people nowadays, they're using layer two. They're using they're buying money on Coinbase or something like that meaning they're not really using Bitcoin at all. I, I want people to understand if you have money on exchanges, you don't have money, okay? I just wanna be clear. Um, that is just you paying a company to pretend that you have, that you own this address that you don't really have uh, and they promise that you'll be able to cash them out. But th that's not real. That is not using cryptocurrency the way it's supposed to be used because you're not really in control of it. Um, and you know the, the thing I said earlier about gold, right? Um, the disaster of gold, you know, leaving the gold standard happened because so many people were using these layer twos. And I think it, it's very feasible. This is going to sound crazy. I'm going to say it. It's going to sound crazy. But I think this is a there's a high possibility of this happening. You know, if if Bitcoin becomes widely used, uh, let's say we have all this, the big exchanges and they're all sort of regulated by the government. It's very plausible if Bitcoin becomes well used that the government can step in and say, oh, well, we need to stimulate the Bitcoin economy. So you need to not let people cash out and we're going to print 2 million Bitcoin. And if it's in, if it's not on layer one, if it's on layer two, you can do that. You can very easily do that. Okay. If you're using centralized exchanges that are just, you know, none of it's real anyway. Um, mm -hmm. that, yeah, so yeah. that is one of the reasons you don't want to do these things. Like if you're, if you're using them, you know, just Kate, bear in mind, you're not really using the cryptocurrency that you think you're you're doing. You know what I mean? Um, do you do you think we get to that point where people move off of, uh, you know, these third parties and actually start using crypto peer to peer? If, if they need to, it will happen. I mean, I think a lot of people um, uh, I, I think as time goes on and as, well, let me give you a minor example. I have a friend who uh, is actually a YouTuber. He's actually bigger than me. I live in the middle of nowhere, but I'm actually not the number one YouTuber out here. It's, it's really <laughs> weird. But, um, you know, he, I remember he would get one thing about if you if you have a YouTube channel, uh, the amount you get paid in ad, re ad revenue is different every month. OK, and it might be wildly different. OK, so there's one time that he went to the bank or the bank called him up and it shut down his account or you know, frozen it because he got some huge amount of money out of nowhere. You know what I mean? And, and that's the kind of stuff you have to deal with. I, I mean, in the modern world where you have, um, especially on the internet where, you know, nothing is the same every week. Everything is different. And the, the current financial system is based on patterns. It's based on credit scores. It's based on, you know, having a bank account that gets the same check every week. And as time will go on, I think more people will, will realize it's not really sustainable to have a financial system like that. You really want one that you have control over, that you, you, know, you can receive payments and you can send payments how you want to use them. And um, so especially as digital technology advances, uh, it's going to be really hard to not have cryptocurrency with that. And I think a lot of the Bitcoin maxis you know, have always said one of the things missing from the Internet was that way to exchange value. OK, PayPal isn't cutting it. You know, Stri Stripe isn't cutting it. All, all that stuff. It's not cutting it. You really need a kind of protocol where you can exchange value. That's the thing that's most important. Um, everything else is just faking it, you know. Totally agree. Um, I often uh, I, I was watching today, watching some of your videos. I saw you bring I see you bring up Ted Kaminsky every once in a while. Right? <laughs> that's uh... that, yeah, that, that's like a recurring joke. A couple of years ago, I remember. Uh, some friend recommended me to like read his little manifesto and I talked about it in a live stream and it just sort of became like a, a running joke on my channel. But now it's it's gone on. I don't know. People are talking about this guy. Yeah. Well, I read his paper. You know, I always knew that he, you know, was a really super intelligent guy. Oh, yeah. uh, I never stopped to read his paper, but I read his paper. And uh, yeah, you, you think he's going to be crazy. Then you read it and you're like, oh, wow. <laughs> what do you think? What do you think his opinion of, of crypto would be? He, he well, seemed to be a, you know, a, a fatalist in terms of technology. You know, he was worried about technology. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I'm a fatalist in technology as well. But if you're using it, you should do it right. That's my that's my view. And it's the same thing. I mean, that's what my channel's about. Um, 
I absolutely, the best recommendation I can give to people is get off the internet, you know, like do stuff in real life. You know what I mean? Um, but if you're on the internet, you want to do things, for example, you want to, um, you don't want to use centralized platforms. You want things in your control. And cryptocurrency is an example of that. I'm a big advocate of, uh, you know, people starting their own websites and stuff. Because if you're using the, the internet, you should be using it in the way that it was originally founded. That is, you have your own little internet castle and it's decentralized and you can relate. You can talk to the other people using other protocols. Uh, back in the day, you know, IRC and email, but now we have, you know, fancier stuff. Um, but um, so I, I think that you should always be wary of technology. And I'm not going to speak for him. I don't know what he, he says, I, I, but um, you should always be wary of technology and its effects on you. But if you're using it, you should use it wisely. Uh, that That's all I would say. I would say that cryptocurrency is indisputably better than using PayPal or something like that. Um, but as for should you store value digitally? I, I don't know. That That's your call. I mean, the only thing, the only circumstance I could think of you losing your stored value on a cryptocurrency is the internet itself collapsing, you know, which I think is a little unlikely, but uh, you never know what kind of apocalypse will happen. So, Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I recommend to people that, you know, definitely read, read his paper. It was, it was very interesting. <laughs> Did you yeah. ever read his, uh, so he came out with a, a book as well? I saw her. Yeah, he did. You know, I don't think I ever read it, although I did have someone send me the books at one point. They're like, hey, you want to read the rest of it? But I never actually ended up reading it. Um, but, you know, that that line of thinking, the whole um, I, a lot of people call them like ecological anarchists. And when you hear that, that makes it sound like they're, you know, you, Greta, whatever her name is, you know, when, right. when they're not. It, it's really it's not even about ecology. It's really about you know, thinking about the human condition and the fact that we're building a technological world that we are not su suited to live in. You know, we're really building things beyond our control. These Lovecraftian beasts that make us miserable and, you know, things don't really work out the way. I mean, we, we live in this centralized environment because people are using technology in a, a uh, unfortunate way. Um, so I think that, you know, if you're using technology, I mean, my ideal would be technology like computers should be kind of the equivalent of like, uh, let's say a car mechanic. Like not all of us can repair cars. Some of us know some stuff about it. Uh, and there'll be a guy in your, you know, maybe in your family, in your town who can repair cars, but it really shouldn't, it doesn't need to be something that everyone does. And I sort of feel the same way about a lot of technology things. I think it's a bad idea for us to have, um, uh, just like technolo technology all over the place, a bunch of kids in their iPhones all the time. I think that's extremely unhealthy. I think it should be a much, you know, people should do it much, you know, more infrequently. Um, and when they do use a computer, use it for specific productive purposes. I mean, that that's what I can recommend people to do. And that's a hard thing to do because, wow, look at all the shiny stuff on the internet, you know? Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. I, some, you know, I feel my best probably when I'm completely disconnected. You know, oh, yes. yeah, um, it, it's I, a great. I, I think people should uh, regularly take breaks from the internet. Um, you know, hey, take take uh, the weekend off from the internet or go yeah. a week without it, and that includes a cell phone. In fact, especially a cell phone. <laughs> so. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, I haven't done that in, in a real way in a long time. When I graduated college, I mean, this is before we did, there wasn't really a smartphone yet. People had the Blackberries, but, you know, it was, people were using them quite a bit. I was, and I remember I, I had lost or broke my phone. And I was like, you know what? I'm just not going to fix it. And I had my voicemail set up. So I was like, I'm just going to let, if people need me, if they really need to get in touch, they could just, yep. you know, leave a voicemail. And I did yeah. that. I ended up doing it for like six months. Oh, that's it was, great. It was great. It was yeah. great, but it was the last time, you know, they'll probably. Yeah. I, I've had a couple of times where I've been without a cell phone and it's always great. And in fact, I've, when I started my YouTube channel, I owe, I owe my YouTube channel to an event like this. Uh, I actually did a video talking about it a while ago, but. When I moved into an apartment in Tucson, I scheduled to have the internet connected, you know, so I could have the internet in my house and they never showed up. And I didn't pay my bill because they didn't show up. So I had no internet. And I lived at that apartment for two years with no internet, just because, you know, I'm, uh, the other guy, they charged too much. And that was fantastic. And that was the time when I really, ironically enough, I started to use technology even better. I didn't just start reading more. I did do that. But, um, you know, I had my computer and that's when I started learning, okay, how do I write, 
you know, ha let's do some scripting. Let's automate some stuff. That's when I started using Linux and a lot of other things. And so that time, I, I, I think the internet is very distracting. Um, and I think, although you have this machine that can do anything and you can really, you could use it to get rich, you can use it to, you know, make friends and do all these great things. Most of the time people aren't going to do that because, you know, they're distracted by YouTube videos or porn or I, I don't know, you know, any, whatever people are watching. And that's the most important thing. Discipline yourself, separate yourself from those kind of things. Um, and you know, that's the problem with technology. It, it gives you a lot of great stuff. Um, but, uh, you know, it, there's this kind of poison pill, like it's mostly poison. You know, you really have to pick the good stuff out of it. Definitely. Definitely. What do you, um, how do you see Monero or whether it's maybe something else, but this, this idea of the censorship resistant value transfer system, we've never had anything like right. this before. Right. I mean, obviously we had gold, but now it, now it's digital and I, yeah. you know, I can zap a million dollars to somebody you know, in Brazil and right now, right. Or whatever. I mean, it's, it's power that we've never had. It's a type of technology that we've never had. It's like Liberty that we've never seen before. What effect do you think that's going to have on the world? Do you, do you think about how it's going to change the world? Um, I, I think of it less in terms of changing the world, more in terms of making things more efficient. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of hurdles you don't have to jump through. I mean, compare, you know, let's say you memorize your seed phrase for Monero, which is hard. What is it like 24 word, 25 words or whatever. But that's all you have to do to store your value. You know, you don't have to buy a giant safe. Uh, I mean, you could buy a small safe and put your seed phrase in there. But, you know, th there are all these things that it makes a lot more efficient. Um, and I think most of it, like, I don't think that we're going to live in this totally different world because we have this digital way of exchanging value. I mean, we might, but I think it's, I look at it mostly in terms of everything's going to get just a little bit more efficient. You're not going to have to worry about, you know, PayPal fees or, you know, the, these other kind of things or your bank freezing your account. If you get some transaction that they didn't expect, which is totally normal and totally legal and, you know, totally okay. Um, so it's mostly just, it, it gets rid of this frustration of what we have to deal with and a lot of innovation. I mean, that's how it is. It's just getting rid of frustrations. And that's sort of how I look at it. I don't know. Were you expecting me to talk about it's going to give us flying cars or something? I don't know. What you're looking for, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I don't, I, I don't know. You know, uh, if you look at it in like the terms of, you know, Liberty, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a new right. tool for Liberty, right? It's yeah. Preserve yeah it our well, I will say it definitely. Um, it detracts the ability of censorship. I, I think we now know, we're now very familiar with a, a kind of witch hunting class of journalists who seek people out and and uh, you know try and make their lives miserable and stuff like that. And you know, or even things like governments that suppress people. Um, and a lot of people talk about um, resisting these people and and throwing it in their face and you know civil disobedience. I think all of that's BS. What we need is to have technologies that make regulation irrelevant. Okay. If you have something like Monero, uh, I mean, one example that I think is really funny, you know, the other month, uh, Iran passed some kind of legislation saying you can't, if you mine Bitcoin in Iran, you can't transfer it out of Iran. Okay. That's the most incoherent and unenforceable law ever. What does it mean to mine cryptocurrency in Iran? Like how do you tie an address to a specific place? You know, it, it doesn't make any sense how you keep them from transferring it out. The nice thing about even Bitcoin there is it makes the regulation irrelevant. And Monero goes one step further because in the case of Bitcoin, you can get found out, right? If you're an Iranian mining Bitcoin, but in the case of Monero, it just makes it, it uh, no one knows what's going on, right? And so the, the great thing about it is it makes, um, the, the goal should not be to violate the law. I, I don't agree and viol you know, I, th I think civil disobedience in, in actual civil disobedience, like when people are actual dissidents, you are not going to get anywhere by, you know, doing things illegal or telling people to do things that are illegal. So it's very stupid. Um, and even not just about, you know, laws, even when we're talking about cancel culture, I hate that term, cancel culture. Um, you know, what you need to aim for is not fighting against these powers. It's making their power irrelevant. And that is what Monero does in terms of, in terms of value. That's what decentralization does in technology. That's why I, I've advocated to people on my channel, 
I'm not into social media. It's not, it's not a privacy thing. I just don't do it. Um, but there are many ways to have federated and decentralized social media sites. You know, you have all, everything based on it, activity pub. You have these things like Pleroma, which is a decentralized Twitter network. Anyone can start a server and they can all talk to each other. Um, you know, I even have, uh, I keep all my videos on my personal website. If you go to videos.lukesmith.xyz, I have all my videos there. And that actually is interfaces with other decentral, that's called PeerTube. And it interfaces with other decentralized networks. So people can post from their Pleroma profile, which is like a Twitter profile, and post on my videos, you know. Um, so, so those are the benefits of decentralization. Um, it, it makes everyone, you're not beholden to some centralized party. Instead, everyone has their own server. That's how the internet is supposed to work. You're supposed to have your own, you know, website and stuff like that. Um, so it makes the cancel culture or whatever very much irrelevant because they can't, they can't smash all the servers out there. It's just not possible, you know? So. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree. So do you think it's going to have a real... But I guess what I was getting at was going to have a real dramatic effect on the world as we know it. Or you think it's going to like change, you know, power structures? Are there going to be noticeable changes? I, I think that <laughs> what will happen now. I, well, I, I, I'm not big into predictions, but I will say that I think the goal should be creating people that are independent of the system. They're not thinking in terms of oh, I got to be worried not to say this on, on the internet or something like that. You just put people in a position where they don't have to think about traditional authorities. Mind you, not in a position where they're undermining them, but just in a place where they're free. They, they don't have to think about it. And that by itself is, you know, liberating, right? Um, you know, that's why I've, I've talked about in my video videos, you know, the importance of even moving out of cities, like cities can be very constraining. They're, they're bad for your privacy. They're bad for your health. And it's better to be a property person out in a place where everything's cheap than live in a city. You know what I mean? Live in an apartment or something like that. Um, and, and just those little things, just as long as you have power over your own life. And that is actually a Kaczynski thing as well. If you have power over your own life, everything else falls out from that. You don't have to worry about all this junk, you know? Yeah, yeah. What is your expertise in? I saw you you did you uh I think one of your first videos, I think I went to the oldest video you had. It was oh, yeah. you, you were giving a presentation. Was that your uh that that was probably I me presenting at a, a linguistics conference, if I remember that video right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I mean I have I have a, I did a bunch of formal education in a bunch of different places. Uh I my first degree was actually in economics. Um, and I, I was interested in like game theory and stuff like this. Um, but in graduate school, this was around the time of the financial crisis. I ended up going into grad school for uh, linguistics because I was very much interested in classical languages. When I was in high school, I learned like Latin and Greek and I was interested in like reconstructing uh, things like Indo-European and stuff like that. And that actually got me into formal linguistics. And uh, I don't know, I've just touched on a lot of different topics. I rarely talk about linguistics on my channel. I have a couple videos where I have, uh, you know, I talk about some formal things, but um, I, don't, I don't, honestly, I touch on a lot of stuff. I think it, it's probably weird for a lot of my subscribers that I have histories in other fields because a lot of people see my stuff and think I'm like a computer person, which I'm, I, I mean, well, I guess I am now, but five years ago, I wasn't, you know what I mean? So that's just how I live my life. I, I get bored of things that I do for too long. So we got to no, move on to something else. That's good. Yeah. Good I'm just one of those people trying to figure, figure it out. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. That makes you all the more interesting. Well, yeah. I mean, one thing that I've realized is people, and I, maybe I should have done this if I wanted to be a real, you know, e-celebrity or something, but you know, people, there's always this tendency to brand your channel. Like this is what I do. This is what I'm interested in. Uh, this is the kind of person I am. In reality, I think most people, they don't work like that. They don't have one interest. They don't, um, uh, I mean, I definitely don't identify with my interests. I think it's important not to do that, in fact, because you'll often get offended or confused by things. Um, I think that, you know, I'm really, I think that everyone should be a master of every trade. You know what I mean? Uh, that's just my perspective. Um, but, you know. Yeah. Are you, uh, do you, are you passionate about crypto or it's just kind of, uh, you know, one of, one of the things that's, um, that I think it's across important. your table. Uh, I, I think it's important. And I will say that I, I've been reading a lot more 
analytical white papers recently and, you know, trying to wrap my head around some new concepts and stuff like this that's right on the bleeding edge. Um, so it, it might be something that I pursue in the future, but um, honestly, maybe it's just because we're going through a bull run or whatever and there's a lot of interest in it. Um, but uh, I, I, but it's one of those things where I think that is it's just going to be part of our reality in the coming years. I think that it's just going to be normalized. Uh, cryptocurrency probably, I mean, Bitcoin and Monero and Ethereum are probably going to be, you know, pretty big. Uh, I mean, well, they already are. Um, but, you know, Monero definitely in terms of uh, they actually use it. That That's one thing that separates Monero from other uh, cryptocurrency projects. So I think it's going to become more and more part of our culture. Uh, I see a bunch of people. I, I will tell you in my life, uh, I have the people who have been getting cryptocurrencies that I know. I would never have guessed that they would be buying this fake Internet money. But... <laughs> You know, everyone has on the Robinhood app, right? On, oh, on Robin yeah, Hood, yeah. You know, they, they bought their yeah. Doge. Yeah, a lot of people I know bought Doge stocks. Oh boy, or <laughs> no one knows how to pronounce it. They'll say dog stocks or something <laughs> like that. But um, you know, I, you know, I have a, a friend whose parent, you know, bought Ripple the other month or something like that, and I was like, what? And this is like a salt of the earth guy, you know. Well, you, you know, the know banks I mean? are using it, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't even. <laughs> no, I, like, no, the that's that's the, you know the ongoing joke. Yeah, Ripple, Ripple is like the anti-Monero, basically. Right. Um, but, you know, either way. Um, what was it? I, I had a good uh, good question here. Now it's, it's slipping my slipping oh, yeah. my mind here. So, yeah, you st we talked about the semantics. I was going to bring some. Oh, um, did, did you see Arctic Mine? I don't know. Did, how closely do you follow the Monero community? And, uh, like, I mean, going not on. I don't use Twitter. I don't know if okay. people use Twitter. So I have, have you seen this this talk of Monero potentially kind of being a second layer on top of Bitcoin or because of atomic swaps? Yeah. So oh, well, see, I, I have been the, using that. I've been using that as a troll argument in front of uh, Bitcoin maxis for a while. Oh, um, okay. Oh, that's fine. I, no, I believe in layer two. Monero is my layer two. <laughs> you know but, what? Have you thought about, do you think it's something, a possibility that Monero oh, yeah. becomes more of the transactional and is and is just kind of always tied to Bitcoin? Well, I mean, well, I don't think it'll always be tied to Bitcoin. But as I said earlier, I sort of think of it as Monero is more like a checking account and Bitcoin is more like a long-term savings account. And I think that already people sort of implicitly use them like this, okay? If you're doing any kind of serious transactions, you're going to use Monero. Um, but Bitcoin, due to the networking effects and due to the kind of game theoretic incentive to hodl Bitcoin, people are going to use it as a store of value. So I think that atomic swaps, you know, they're definitely going to get us to the state of, I mean, more officiated state of dualism between the two. Um, and I do think later on, I think Bitcoin might become a little more irrelevant, especially with atomic swaps. When you think about it, I mean, atomic swaps are really going to be tainting Bitcoin. Okay. Because the more people use atomic swaps, it, it's going to be, I mean, you use an atomic swap and trade your Monero in for Bitcoin, there's a really high chance you're going to get a tainted Bitcoin. You know what I mean? Um, so I think that Monero is going to have higher and higher premiums uh, against Bitcoin. Partially, I mean, as I said earlier, the reason people don't think through the ramifications of Bitcoin is because they've never had to deal with the issues. But now that, you know, they're swapping it for Monero and vice versa, and it's you know being used more often, <clears throat> they're going to have to actually deal with these consequences. And I think that Bitcoin will pay the price. It doesn't have the utility of Monero, but yeah, I, I do think that you know if if you are if you all the Bitcoin you have is you know obtained via Monero and you cash it out via Monero, well, your Bitcoin has a lot of the benefits of Monero now. So I mean, that's nice. Definitely, definitely. I see. I see it the same way. What do you think of us, you know, some of the, the strongest arguments against Monero? So, the, you know, that you can't audit the supply as easily as Bitcoin. That's, you know, a big criticism. Uh, obviously, the, the tail emission. So Monero's yeah. criticized without people really understanding its benefits, criticized for that. Yeah. Well, what I mean, are your responses to that? I guess yeah. more, mostly the, um, you know, the, the this fear of, uh, you know, secret, um, you know, inflation things like that? Um, well, you know, I don't have a knockdown argument for that because um, I, I haven't read, you know, enough about it. Uh, it is a concern. Like, 
I, if I can't give you an immediate answer, I at least don't know uh, about the unauditable supply. I know there are some ways of, you know, following the transaction or something like that. But um, w when it comes to tail emission, I think tail emission, I, I think it's an ambiguity because I don't really think that people have worked through the game theoretics of what is actually going to happen when you get to 21 million Bitcoins. You know, will miners actually stop mining? Will there be incentives to go there? I, I think it actually, it, it's a, a function of a couple different things. It's a function of what the price of Bitcoin at that point is going to be. If it's very high, transaction fees might be enough, you know, um, or it might be an issue of what kind of transactions are actually occurring on this. Let's say everyone is using the Lightning Network, uh, which is supposed to, you know, decrease transaction fees. Let's say literally every transaction is on the Lightning Network. Well, there's no way that you're going to have enough transaction fees to support mining. Use. I mean, th that's the irony of Bitcoin. You either solve the transaction fee problem or you solve the, you know, fixed supply, you know, problem where no miners want to mine. Um, so I, I will say, I think that there is a case to be made um, that maybe fixed supply is preferable. But Monero, I, I think just by virtue of there being a question mark, tail emission is a safe thing to do. Because as years go on, as people say, it's asymptotically zero. And, uh, you know, you don't really have to worry about it as time goes on. And, you know, stores of value like gold, their supply is, you know, constantly increasing. And it's not increasing at it. Well, I guess it would be asymptotically zero depending on where you're. Well, I don't know. It depends on, you know, how the technology for mining gold works, right? Um, now, as it comes to actual criticisms of Monero, I think there are a couple I alluded to this before, and maybe this isn't a criticism, but this is a needs improvement kind of thing. Um, you know, Monero, I think, really needs to use zero knowledge proofs. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people in Monero, uh, because this is associated with like Zcash, you know, because they, they sort of popularize using zero knowledge proofs. Uh, there's this kind of um, uh, I don't know, unreadiness, like people, people are like, oh, that's their thing. We do it our way. But, you know, Monero's privacy features, which are very nice, like ring signatures and stealth addresses, they're nice, but they're hacky, okay? Um, and it's not as scalable as zero-knowledge proofs. And if we can get zero-knowledge proofs in a way that we can have a trustless setup, uh, it would be much preferable to move Monero over to something like that. It'd be a smaller blockchain. It would be uh, easier to, to um, you know, you just have less junk in it. Um, and there are some issues people... In Monero, I mean, there are ways of looking at Monero transactions and by process of elimination, figuring out where they move. So let's say that we're very stupid in how we use Monero and I buy from some exchange and I get Monero and I send it straight to you and you take that output and you take it to that exchange, right? So we've just had one output went from me to you and the exchange knows where it started and where it ended, right? So. If the the you know if there's a very simple structure, even if you have a bunch of ring signatures and stuff like that, making it unclear, an exchange or a third party can still look back and say, oh well, here are the plausible places where this transaction has gone, right? And of course, it's not it's not as bad as Bitcoin in the sense that it's not giving us an individual private wallet or anything like that. But there is a sense in which you can see where that transaction is going, and if you have exchanges which are tied to your identity. Or if you have, um, uh, you know, if let's say the government is looking at many different exchanges, that can be a liability. So that, that's another reason I think zero knowledge proofs are long term a better thing for Monero to have. Now, I just to be clear, Monero is number one right now. Okay, there's no one, no one Zcash doesn't come close. None of these pirate doesn't come close. Like none of these, they're not going to work. Um, they, they all have big problems. Okay, uh, so Monero is number one, but I do think that you know, zero, zero knowledge proofs should be integrated as time goes on. Now, I am not a pro. The, the pros who are, you know, developing Monero might be looking at me right now and laughing and saying, oh, there are all these things we have to do and blah, blah, blah. And you know what? I'm sure they're right. But I'm just saying that I think that that is something that we need to integrate, you know. That, yeah, no, I, I, I think I'm sure. opinion. Like you said, you know, once once it can be done in a way with no with no trusted setup, uh, you know, in, in theory, it seems like the, the direction... Right. I mean, zero knowledge eventually get rid of the those ring signatures. But you know, they're 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 adding. I'm sure you've seen um, 
uh, you know, we'll be increasing the ring size and adding other technology to make essentially right. add efficiencies there with the ring signature. So we get up, you know, multiply it by a factor. Yeah. 10 well, more. yeah, it's just it's a much cleaner. I mean, it's sort of what I said, you know, about Bitcoin versus Monero. You you want your base layer to do everything right. You want it to be clean. And zero knowledge proofs are just a lot cleaner than the hacky way that Monero is using now, which works, works, it works fine. It has some deficiencies, but it's still, I mean, it still is very workable as a currency. We all know. So, you know, I'm not saying anything bad. I'm a Monero maximalist, but <laughs> I, I would be dogmatic if I could not find something, you know, to, some kind of fault to it. Um, so that, that's the one thing that I, I think um, people should be open to, but again, you know, Definitely. might, might be complications. No, I, I think you're, I think you're on the right track. You know, I mean, the way I look at it is, you know, Monero has achieved digital cash it's digital cash today right. uh but then it also it has this ethos uh where it's always striving to maintain it right. and it's, yeah. it's willing to it wants to evolve you know it wants right. to add features and it realizes yeah. that then the community kind of as a whole is on board for that right as opposed and, to you know bitcoin where they've promoted this idea right. of you know it is just a store of value and actually it's it's better if we if we don't really evolve much at all yeah. Uh, they kind of, they kind of see that in you know they put that in the in the positive column. Yeah, uh, Monero kind of sees it as a never ending battle. Yeah, I do think. Um, I mean, I I think there will come a point where the changes that need to be made will, you know, they'll just be diminishing needs for them. Uh, once the yeah. I think zero knowledge proofs will solve a lot of the problems because uh, as I said, the system now is very hacky. Once it's unhacky, once it's once it's clean, it's one of those things you can sort of set it and forget it. Um, but yeah, one of the great things about Monero in terms of its development is you do have people who are constantly working on it and, you know, are open to hard forks, including, you know, all the mining people. Um, and that is, you know, it, it's something you really need because we're still working on this technology that, you know, is really, it's becoming a natural resource. I, I think when we talked about gold earlier, you know, a, the thing with gold is that it's something we found in the ground and it works as a store of value. It doesn't work as a good currency. That's why we have layer two for gold, which is paid per money. Um, but the thing about where we are right now is that we have a unique position of being able to design our natural resources, okay? And that's why Monero is so important uh, because it is our, uh, our opportunity to design a store of value and design a medium of exchange. And let's just do it right. And I think eventually, as the years go on, we'll realize, okay, we have converged on some, something that works very well and we can stick with it. And eventually, hopefully there'll be a point uh, where this goes for any software, but hopefully there's a point where you can just say, okay, it's done, okay? <laughs> it might just need a little tweak every once in a while, but you know, I hopefully they'll, they'll will come, come a point. Um, so I understand the Bitcoin people who say, okay, we got a system that works, let's just sit with it. Um, and that, that's the ideal. That's what we want. It's just sure. Bitcoin people, they're not caring about the things that matter, you know? Right, they're right. like, uh, we'll build it on top of it later, you know? Right. They, they think they've already uh, arrived. Um, what would you say is like your, you know, you, you have some videos that are that are super popular. Um, are those the videos that are most popular, are those like your favorite videos? Or are there things that you've done videos on where you're like, wow, this is, you know, I'm putting out some real you know, interesting information here. I, ho I hope the world, uh, you know, really appreciates this. Like what, yeah. are, does it happen to match what your most popular videos are? Yeah, I mean, some, when I started my channel, I, when I was just doing technology stuff, it used to be that my most popular videos, they were the ones I really like. I don't even know what my most popular video is now, but I will say as time has gone on, I don't appreciate the tastes of some people, you know, <laughs> videos that I feel like should go viral, they don't. The videos that go viral, I'm like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever put out, you know. Um, so, it, you know, when it comes to YouTube, a lot of it is just what gets recommended. Um, so I, I can't really know. And I, as you know, the weird thing about my channel is because I do, I mean, I do technology stuff. But again, I have a lot of other things that, I mean, there are plenty of people who watch my channel, even though like 80% of it is like Linux stuff. There are a lot of people who couldn't care less about Linux. And in every video, they're like, stop doing Linux videos. I want to see this or that, you know? Um, and there are some people who are like, I just watch for the personality, which is like, okay. It feels like I have a cult or something. But um, yeah, I don't know what people are going to like. And uh, one thing 
you know, I've in my mind, I don't really have a YouTube channel. Like I've never branded it. I've never put intros on it. I've never done any of that kind of stuff. So I, I sort of want to not think about the views I get on videos and just do out do what I think is important. Right. So we'll see. Cool. Well, you're doing a great job. What um I'll be follow, continuing to follow you. I, I do I do enjoy your content, man. It's it's interesting stuff. All right. Um what kind of response have you gotten from your 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 followers there regarding Monero? Because you you put out a few videos on it. What are people saying? Are they uh um I I think into it? Are they like what are you what are you talking about? Well, I think most people who don't know about Monero don't know about Monero, so they're not gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna click on this video about Monero. Okay. Um I, I've only done a couple. I think I did one. I did one a week or so ago about setting up a Monero wallet, which most people are not going to care about, right? right Unless right. those are those are scary words. Uh, and I've done some conceptual videos in the past, and those get more views. Um, but it's one of those things, like to induce someone. The thing with cryptocurrency, and this is the reason that I didn't get into it for ten years. You know what I mean? It, it's so different from everything you're used to. It's very hard for you to take that and make sense of it, right? So. It's it's like being inducted into a big cult. These people are talking about public and private keys, decentralized transact, blockchains, blah, blah, blah. I mean, all it, it, there's all this esoteric language that most people are so confused by. And, you know, that's one of the reasons that when people are using cryptocurrency, they're using it on centralized exchange, exchanges that make things easy for them, right? Um, they don't really get the point. They're just, they just think, oh, it's like PayPal, but with, not dollars, this other currency that I don't know how it works. So um, it, it's something I haven't really ever tried to induce people into the cryptocurrency world. I've just done a couple of vi videos on topics that I think are important uh, when it comes up. But um, are you, are you I, honestly, I think I probably should do more tutorials just about here's how you get started with this. Here's what this means. You know, I don't yeah, know. Please, please do. Please do. I think it would go a long way. Are people responding um, with other coins? Or they're like, actually, no, Luke, you should look at this. Don't um, you know? No, no I mean, the only, when it comes to Monero, I think that you got them all beat. Okay. I've had very few people, um, like I've never had someone say, oh, use Zcash. It's better. Like no one's, because right. no one really thinks that. I don't know what they're thinking. Who use that. <laughs> Um, the, the closest thing I've had is people recommended me to look at other privacy coins, like actual privacy coins, like, oh, look at Wow Narrow or okay. look at Pirate or something like that. Um, but, you know, Wow Narrow is just goofy Doge aesthetic Monero. Yeah. There are some differences, right? Um, and Pirate has its own problem because 90% of its supply is already mined. So, <laughs> you know, that's an issue. Okay. Um, so. But yeah, I mean, no, no one. If you're if you're asking, like, are people anti Monero out there? I would say no, because the people who, I mean, the, it, the problem is mostly people don't know about it. <laughs> you know, they they just think of. I mean, you have to. Well, I don't know. Maybe you've. I guess you've been on a lot longer than me. But you know, when I was looking at this cryptocurrency stuff as an outside observer, I knew there was this thing called Bitcoin, and I just thought a bunch of people were making like Bitcoin renamed. Okay. And I yeah. think that's how a bunch of people think of it. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, they're all the same thing. Like you look at Ethereum and, you know, Ethereum, there's a whole, you know, the whole decentralized digital computer, you know, global computer. That's its whole idea behind Ethereum. But, you know, as a normie, people just look at that and they say, oh, it's just like Bitcoin with a different, you know, logo. You know, that that's how most people look at it. So it's hard to induce people into it, you know. Any ideas of what, you know, Monero community could be doing to, you know, get the word out, better market itself? Um, well, I, I don't know about that. I mean, I would put it this way. Uh, I think I, I when I did a video a week or so ago when I told people just get a Monero wallet. OK, here's here's what I think. I think maximizing visibility is a good thing. Um, so if you have a website, put a big donate Monero to me thing at the bottom. OK, just not it's not about getting donations. It's about you know, telling people this network is here, we're using it, screw all those other currencies that no one actually uses as a currency. This one is where it's at. And just, you know, it, it's sort of like in the same way corporations will put, you know, uh, you know, product placement in movies, okay? Just whispers at the water cooler, I think are enough, 
Okay. And a lot of, you know, during this period where people are a asking about cryptocurrencies and people are buying dog coins and stuff like that, uh, or dog stocks, right? Um, just be ready to say, hey, I'm not interested in that. I, I do have some assets like this. For example, there's this thing called Monero. Here is why I use it. Here's what makes it different. And a lot of people, when you talk to them in real life, they'll be, oh, like cryptocurrencies actually do stuff. Like they're supposed, they're different. I thought it was just like brand. It's like a Big Mac versus a Whopper. Okay. You know, that's how they think about it. Um, but once you explain, you know, use that as an opportunity to explain it to them. But you just have to remember that it's a hard thing. If you have been in Bitcoin for forever, you take it for granted that this stuff is easy for you. Okay. Even if you don't know, know that much about technology, but for new people, it is utterly confusing, confusing. Oh, this long string address that you send money to. I don't get it. What does that mean? How do I click on it? You know, that's what people are thinking about. Yeah. We started, uh, it's called gratuitous coffee and we sell coffee online and you can yeah. send a tip in Monero and it goes to the farmers, but we, we sell it. Uh, I've been selling it on the streets over here in Brooklyn. So oh. it's actually great because it allows me to talk to everybody. You know, oh, yeah. everybody knows crypto now. They've all heard of Bitcoin at this point. So right. I remember, you know, year, a few years ago, it was like you had to have that conversation first. Now they've at least have heard of Bitcoin. Yeah. Most people have heard of Doge more so than anything else. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, you introduce them to Monero. And yeah, it's definitely an eye opener yeah. when you're like, oh, you could send a tip and it goes directly to the farmers. And they're like, oh, that's cool. They're like, yeah. uh, we use Monero. And they're like, what's Monero? I'm like, yeah. it's the private version of Bitcoin. They're like, what do you mean? <laughs> like, well, Bitcoin's not private. It's not, you know? And yeah. then like, and then I'm like, well, actually you couldn't even use this with Bitcoin privacy aside, uh, just cause it costs like 10 bucks just to send the transaction. They're like, yeah. what? you know, it's like people just, they have, they have no idea. Yeah. And uh, I, I think necessity is the mother of getting into crypto. Like when people see the reasons for using it, um, I think that'll drive them on. And as it is, most people, they don't really have a reason to use it. Yeah. Um, but one thing I would also tell the people, especially in the United States, a lot of people right now, you know, you look at prices, people are worried about inflation. OK, that's one thing that's very real. Everything is going up. Um, and I, I think it's a good conversation to have with people. Hey, if you got a, a, a thousand extra dollars or something like that, look into putting it into some kind of digital asset. Even if that digital asset decreases in real terms, if we live in an environment of hyperinflation, that is storing your value much, much better, you know. Um, so that's another thing I think people need to realize, but, but particularly in Monero, right? Um, because you can't buy it on exchanges or many exchanges, right? Um, Monero is in some respects limited to people who already know a little bit about Bitcoin, right? Oh, it's, it's easy to exchange Bitcoin on one of these swap sites for Monero. It's a little harder to buy Monero itself on one of these exchanges. And I think of that as a very good thing, actually, because I, I think that none of these people getting into Monero should be using it on an exchange. It defeats the purpose. If you're, if it, I mean, sure, you could transfer it out. Yes, and you should. If you have Monero on, a, on an exchange, transfer it out. Actually, transfer anything out, please. Um, but, um, you know, so in order to go to actually learn about Monero, you have to learn about core concepts, private wallets, seed phrases. Then you have to, you know, get Monero somehow. You know, I guess you have to get, you know, some kind of, send in your ID to some company or something like that, or get Bitcoin and then swap it from Monero. So there's a whole lot of stuff going on. And that's why the other week when I did a video, again, just, you know, here's how you start a Monero wallet. I said to people, just even if you don't have any clue how to cash this out or put money into it, just get a wallet, just get a place where you can receive donations and then put up, you know, excellent stuff on your website. And maybe you'll get a couple dollars, you know, just, just get your toes wet because I know that when people do that, you have got to think like a, a teacher, you know, instructing students. Once people do that, they're going to say, now that I have my feet wet, maybe I should actually look up how this works. You know, that's actually how it happens. And oh, again, that's, that, that's how it happened with me. People just said, hey, get a Monero donation address. I want to give you just like two dollars with Monero. Right. And I looked it up and put it out there. And now I'm like, oh, well, I better look up what, what's special about Monero, you know? So get people into it and then they'll figure it out, you know, even if they're not putting money down or anything like that. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah, I do that to people all the time too. You know, I try to get them, if I'm buying something, you know, uh, if there's like some vendor, 
I try to get them on the spot to download, you know, right. cake wallet. And then I, you know, I pay, I pay Monero. Yeah. You know? I, I, I think also, um, I know that there are some projects like this, but it would be very nice if someone had a very, uh, easy to use kind of, uh, a, I, I guess more like a web backend where people could easily receive Monero transactions and stuff like this. Um, this is something I, I mean, there are things for like WooCommerce, you can get like a Monero plugin to receive stuff. But I, I think even, I mean, WooCommerce, I mean, in order to have that, you have to have WordPress and all this kind of stuff. I'm I'm talking about bare, bo bare bones stuff, like minimalist stuff. I think it'd be very nice to have something like that. And I think there are some people working on kind of like a super chat thing for Monero. I don't think there's much development in that, but you know, I, I think uh, there's a tendency to create uh, all these different cryptocurrency projects, you know, let's say to, um, you know, for content creators or whatever, and they have their own special token and stuff like that. Really what we need is Monero to be integrated in these other sites because it's already usable. It's already private. It, are, it already is that base le level that we need that works. Um, it just needs to, you know, have its fingers in more stuff. And, you know, I would like very easily, it, let's say you have a, a drop ship shipping business where you're selling something online, um, just to, to be able to plug in some kind of Monero module mm -hmm. and receive transactions very easy, that would be a nice thing. And mm -hmm. it would be easier for your customers. It would be privacy respecting. It'd have all the benefits, okay? Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I know there's ones being worked on. I, Change now, I know, is developing one. But yeah, I know oh, there's way. other. Yeah, uh, Globy, obviously, but that's a little. Yeah, um, Change now, I think, is coming out with an interesting product that can be able to easily uh, use it on Shopify and um, yeah. some of the other places. Yeah, see, see, I, but I, I'm looking for something that has no, no dependencies. Just you know. No, I got you. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. I think that might exist in some forms. I'm not super technical. I'm so sure. I, I'm sure. I, I would, I would, I would use like more that. of the you know the change now one or the one that's uh, you know. But uh, yeah, t yeah, people are working on it. But totally agree. I mean that that's that should be the approach. And like you said, even just people that can just slap it on their website that says you know send tips in Monero. I accept Monero. Mm -hmm. uh, that really starts to put the the signal out there. All right, man. Any anything else you want to bring up? This is great. Um, yeah, yeah. One, one more thing just came to my head that I didn't say. Um, one other thing you have to realize about uh, the, the problems with Bitcoin. You know, we've been talking about the problems that Bitcoin would give us right now in terms of, uh, you know, it's bad for transactions. It's bad for privacy and stuff like that. Um, but I think also when you have a public blockchain, OK, if you if the government has the ability to look at everyone's transactions, it's actually very tempting for the government and other parties to use that to their benefit. So one thing I also tell the people is, you know, we're very used to being able to exchange cash in real life, right? You know, if you do me a favor or you pay for half my meal, I can give you some cash. We don't have to worry about it. But if we're living in a world where every single transaction, if we were using something like Bitcoin, is monitored in public information, it really gives an incentive for third parties like governments and other things to say, you know what? That should be taxed. That should be regulated. That should be controlled. So I think what people need to realize, you know, Bitcoin maxis and, and other people like this is that, you know, when we're saying we want a private currency, it's not just to protect protect the things that, you know, we want now. It's really to protect us from this greater liability of having a financial system that is entirely public, which is something no one has ever been ready for. And it really is. I mean, it's, it's hard to even... It, it's on. A, if you want to be conspiratorial, you can go back and say that um, you know Satoshi was like literally the NSA or something like that. Because this is such an ideal in terms of everything is public information. It, it, and if we actually had that, thankfully Bitcoin is a terrible currency. But it, if that it actually were a global currency, it would be a disaster for privacy and it'd be a disaster for everyone. Um, if it will become some global currency, it's not really going to be Bitcoin. It's going to be the layer two, three, four, you know, six, whatever. Um, so it's not really going to be Bitcoin, but really, uh, you know, we don't want it to be Bitcoin. It would be a disaster if that were the case. So, you know, anyway, just one one final yeah. random remark. Totally. I, I make that statement all, you know, yeah, I, I think it's, you know, it's it dystopia is, toward, is towards what Bitcoin, where Bitcoin right. is headed. And um yeah you you said it very well i couldn't agree with you more there and i felt like you're like you're you're suggesting i mean it's it's it needs to be built into the tech because 
people are naturally just going to take full advantage of what the tech is. So oh, if, yeah. you, if you can surveil it, they're going to surveil it. So you yeah. can't you can't trust that there's going to be governments that put regulations in place that prevent the surveillance of it or prevent the you know it's it's going yeah. to be used uh, for better or for worse and to the max by the powers yeah. that be. So if you don't if you don't implement those you know, privacy into the core protocol, you could expect yeah. that. It's yeah, gonna- people are very, people are very innocent because, you know, most morally normal people would never think of exploiting this to their own benefit, but there are a lot of people out there who would, okay? So that's what people need to realize. Um, in, in the same thing I said about email, email is a good case. We should have had it encrypted and private by default, and now we're dealing with the, the downsides of that. And now that we're talking about this new natural resource we're creating, cryptocurrency. It really just needs that privacy by default. It shouldn't be a question. You know, that is as important as the, uh, you know, this censorship resistant part of it. Okay. It really is the same thing because you could censor someone in the real world for a Bitcoin transaction. You can't do that for a Monero transaction. All right. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. This is great. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on. Yeah, if you ever, uh, I mean, well, you know, you do your own Monero content on your channel, but you should uh, maybe try to get somebody on there. Get like Howard Chu on or something. That okay. Would be, All right. <laughs> that'd right. be awesome. About that. Yeah. All right. All right, buddy. Thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, nice being on. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have an Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Monero Talk podcast. Go to monerotalk.live slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we are always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.